Chapter 7 Marriage Two Worlds Together Marriage is a way of taking the call of the Spirit further. It brings two souls, two purposes, two worlds together and allows them to bring their gifts forward to benefit the community. Marriage is a way for Spirit to bring its support for two people into one greater energy. It brings together two or many lines of ancestors, two cultures, and many different ways of looking at the world. Marriage is two souls coming into one soul, still distinct but forming one entity. It is a way of bringing two people's gifts together in order to strengthen them and make them even better. It acknowledges that two people are embarking on something that is bigger than them and bigger than the tribe. Marriage is a communion with all the spirit allies. It's a communion with all the gifts that two people or more are bringing together. It's a communion of the things that are at the very core of the soul. Marriage is a renewal of vows for those who have already married. It's a way of family coming together, a way of tribes coming together, and it's an opportunity to celebrate the call that two souls or two spirits heard and answered. When we come together as a couple, we bring two worlds together. In order to open our world to the other person, we must go through spirit. Ignoring spirit and making marriage a private thing that is just between two individuals will bring a lot of disappointment. In the indigenous context of Africa, the concept that each one of us comes into this world for a purpose determines who you eventually enter into a relationship with. Certain purposes are more or less similar. Some are very much alike. This is where you go and look for a possibility of a relationship. Selecting a partner is the business of the elders who, because they know everybody in the village, know everyone's purpose and are best equipped to understand who can go with whom within the community. This requires a great deal of trust and places a lot of burden on the elders. If a marriage doesn't work, they have to figure out a way to correct it through ritual. Elders take several factors into account when making arrangements for the young initiate to marry. Marriages are not arranged randomly. If, for instance, they were to put two people together whose purposes clash, they would murder each other. The elders have to see that your energies are compatible, that you can live with each other in harmony, that your life purposes are on the same road. In addition to that, the elders must divine on the subject to make sure that what they are proposing is meant to work. They will present the matter to spirit and do a ritual to confirm and seal spirit's approval. Then they will inform the villages and the individuals involved in the process, the bride and groom. I had just completed the full cycle of initiation at the age of 16 when I was called into the circle of the elders and I was quite surprised. One can never guess why the elders call one into their circle, but one thing is sure, their cooking pot always has something boiling in it. At any rate, when I got there, they said, well, we have this son who lives in the West and we need somebody who can keep him company. My answer was, what does that have to do with me? And their response was, you see, you are the kind of person who can get along with him. We would like you to marry him. I said, well, isn't there anybody else in the village who can get along with him? My ambivalence about leaving the village led me to a state of confusion, which in turn confused the elders who did not know what to tell me. The only thing they said was, 
Your life purpose, Abonfu, is on the same road as his. We're not trying to force you to marry somebody because we know that being far away from home is very difficult. If he lived somewhere around here, we wouldn't have even called you here. We wouldn't have had this meeting and given you a choice. You would have simply been notified. So I said, how am I going to live far away and be able to survive without my family and without everybody else? And they said, you are going to be taken care of. You just need to give us your yes and then everything will be fine. And I said, well, I can't give you my answer right now because I don't know what I'm dealing with. So they said, well, you have some time. Go think about it and come back and tell us what you think. I thought about it for three months. First, I went to my parents and said, what do you think I should do? They said, no, you can't ask us. We are too attached to this issue to give you good advice. My grandmother had just passed away and she had been my main counselor. After a month, I went to my other grandmothers and they said that they too were too attached to give me any kind of advice. And so, I spent some time around my grandmother's grave. One night, as I was sitting on her grave, these words came to me. Don't worry, just say yes and you'll see that everything will be fine. And so the next day I woke up and went to the elders and said yes. They were quite relieved and they said, we'll start everything and the wedding will be on its way. I didn't know Maladoma, my future husband, but I knew his family. He was the only person in his family that I didn't know. So the wedding came when I was 20 and since in the village you do not need to be at your wedding, Maladoma wasn't there. He was notified by mail afterward. Maladoma had been sent to the west by the elders to teach their wisdom and to become, as his name describes, a friend of the stranger. He had studied first at the University of Aguadagu in Burkina Faso and then at the Sorbonne in France after which he ended up in America. At the time of our wedding, he was in America at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. Maladoma saved enough money to buy himself a ticket and a year later he came home and we met. We were introduced as a couple. We didn't know each other and we wondered how in the world we were going to make anything happen. Now, one of the things that I had learned from the elders in initiation was how to create a sacred space and how to build an intimate relationship in that space. As Maladoma and I spent time together, we started to work on that issue. In the village, women and men do not sleep together. Though they share the same compound, women sleep in their quarters and men sleep in their quarters, and that is because in order to bring their strength to society, they need to empower one another. They need to bring one another's best out so that whenever a woman goes out to meet with the man, there isn't an imbalance created. The first thing that people want to know when they hear of the sleeping arrangement is how a couple manages to get together. I tell them that as long as they keep their creativity and imagination alive, they will figure it out. Maladoma came home and at the time I was sleeping with his mother. His mother and I used to share the same bed. You can understand how frustrating the idea of being married to a woman who sleeps with your mother can be to the western mind. For me, what was harder was being in a sacred space with Maladoma, someone I did not know. There was something strange about it, so I surrendered to spirits, letting them figure it out. All I needed to do when I felt frustrated was to create a sacred space. The way we created sacred space in the village was just by using ash to make a circle. 
You bring an earthen pot full of water and you put it in the middle of the circle. Whoever starts the ritual will sit and wait for the other person to come. When the other person gets there, then you do an invocation. And as you invoke the spirit, something inside automatically unlocks itself. Maladoma and I were strangers to each other, but each time we met in that space, it was as if we had known each other forever. In an indigenous context, because you don't follow romance as a guide to marriage, partners know the true identity of the other. You know the strengths and the weaknesses of the person you are going to marry. That way, you won't wonder 10 years down the road whether you married the right person or their ghost. People think that when they say yes once, it means yes forever. But in the indigenous context, no. That's why you have to constantly renew your vows, whether it's once a year or when somebody else is getting married. If a couple renew their vow at least once a year and are also are able to do ritual constantly to strengthen their connection to spirit and acknowledge each other's spirit, their marriage will never degenerate into weakness. In the Dagadar community, marriage is not a private matter. It's not just two individuals getting married. In fact, when a couple gets married, they create an occasion for other people to renew their vows and to get married once again at the same time. Sharing the wedding is a way of enlisting support for when problems start to hit. In the West, although everybody likes going to weddings, once you call somebody and say that trouble is hit, nobody wants to show up. But in the kind of community I'm talking about, once people have shared in a couple's marriage vow, they are going to be involved in whatever is happening. When trouble hits, they will be the first ones to show up. Marriage is two or more tribes, two villages, or at the least, two families coming together. The two people who actually join in a marriage are almost, in this grand scale, a minor incident. And so I have a strong sense that two people who come together do so not only to affirm their desire to uphold a certain tradition of community, but also because they need this relationship as an icon, a smaller piece of a much bigger sense of connectedness in their life. Let me put it differently. I fell in love with my husband, you know, after we got married. What was important in the process was the realization that he was married not to someone named Sobonfu alone, but to a whole ethnic group, a whole family, and a whole village, and that I, in the middle of that, was of course important, but my importance rested in the grander scale of the community that brought him to me. It made me realize that I could not personalize my relationship with him because it's not an I relationship. It's a we relationship. And the we is not limited to two people, but is extended to a whole village. By voicing their commitment to marriage, a couple voices a commitment to spirit, a commitment to the self, to the other person, and to the community at large. The community, by being there and taking their vow, is doing the same, so it's mutual. A wedding is an opportunity, an obligation almost, for everyone to reaffirm relationships with one another, with the ancestors, with all the things around. So the wedding is not just a matter between two people, but an event with a purpose for everyone in the village. Before a wedding in the village, the people who have gone through initiation with the bride and groom give the couple their blessing and their encouragement. The elders also come and give their blessing. They will add that they have traveled the same route, that it wasn't all smooth, that there are bumps along the road, 
and that this is okay. Hearing from the elders that the intimacy road is not paved with pearls and gold and that you have to constantly work at it helped remove unrealistic expectations from our marriage basket. In our culture, in order for a couple to get married, there are a multitude of rituals that must be done. After the Spirit's approval of the union, for instance, there is the transfer of the two souls ritual. There is another ritual that brings the two souls together. And there is a ritual that unites the purpose of the two people. Because when you marry, there is a purpose in life that you will share. So, however hard it may be to imagine someone not being at his own wedding, it works because the whole wedding is focused on spirit and ritual. If you have some object belonging to and representing the absent person, then a spirit can be brought into the ritual. It is actually there. After the long wedding celebration, there is a welcoming ritual that functions as a bridge to incorporate the bride into the groom's family. Then, usually, one doesn't immediately spend time with her spouse. There's no honeymoon. Some of the bride's family members will stay with her to make sure she is integrating well into her new home. And the women of her new family will spend time with her and welcome her into a new woman's circle where from now on she will be taken care of and given all the support she needs. In Africa, gifts are exchanged before the marriage. This aspect of African culture is usually misunderstood in the West. Many people see it as the selling of the bride. It may have become so in various parts of the continent under the influence of the West and modernity. In those places where people are desperate for material goods and have lost their connection to spirit and ritual. Because their ancestors did something they no longer understand, some people try to take advantage of it however they can. But in Dagada practice, you cannot afford to take such an advantage. Using a family member's marriage gift for personal gain brings death to the family. Some people have tried it, and learn the hard way before dying. During my most recent trip home, the village was upset by the death of a young man who tried to sell the cow that was given for his sister's soul transfer ritual. When he found out that he had been caught by the ancestors, he called everybody to confess what he had done in an attempt to redeem himself, but it was too late. He said that whenever he looked around, he saw himself being beckoned by his own ghost. No one could have imagined that such an adored young man could have been tempted in this way. It was not that he was ignorant of the danger, but the temptation of a trip to a city in the Ivory Coast just clouded his ability to see and feel his responsibilities. When a woman marries, Although she keeps her family name and passes it over to her children, she moves to her husband's family. We are thus matrilineal and patrilocal. In order for the bride to leave her house, her soul has to be transferred from her family to her husband's. This is done by a giveaway, a sacrifice of a cow. This cow is given by the husband's family to the family of the bride. Without this transferring of the soul ritual, the woman usually finds it hard to stay in her new family. Her spirit will long to go back to the place where it feels at home. When the bride's family receives the cow, it is slaughtered, then left on the roof of the family compound as an offering to spirit. It has to be left out for at least one night for the spirit to come and feast on it and nobody shall eat a piece until the spirit has been satisfied. So the spirit will come and inspect what it has been given and decide whether it is satisfied with the ritual. If not, 
on the next day you will find that the meat is inedible. This means that the sacrifice was not done properly. But if you go the next day and find that it's okay, you know that it is good, that spirit has feasted on it, and then everybody else may feast on it. The meat is first shared among everybody in the bride's family. Then some of it is taken to the husband's family. It's their responsibility to share with their village. Now, after the soul has been transferred from one house to another, there is another ritual that has to be done in order to bring the two souls together. All the family members come together. There is an invocation calling the spirit to come and oversee this union. And if there's any obstacle, the spirits are asked to clear the path for the couple to give them their blessing and an extra eye to see to help them with their day-to-day -day life. A pot made for the occasion is brought out and the birthstones of the bride and groom are put together in it. These are the stones that were picked by them during the hearing rituals done before their birth. In addition, two pots containing each person's medicine are blessed. Then everybody present offers a prayer for the couple and afterward they put water in the pot with the stones. Sometimes they put additional things such as seeds and roots in it. Then the pot is taken to the husband's family shrine. It will remain there for the rest of the couple's lives. Back in the village these two stones are together in the medicine room for the marriage of Maladoma and me. When one of us dies, a ritual of separation will allow the stones to be taken out of the pot and the stone of the deceased person will then be placed in or on top of the grave. These are some of the rituals associated with marriage in our culture. There are many, many more. When people say that they get married in order to have children, the statement is too limited. It does not take into account that the two spirits who have come together have their own higher purposes. If a couple is married only in order to have children, they risk failing to fulfill their own purposes, and this failure is transferred to the child. What I mean by this is that if two people who are married do not acknowledge that they have a higher purpose to fulfill and limit their marriage to just having children, they put their purpose to sleep. When children finally arrive, the parents realize that there is something that they haven't been able to fulfill and they hope their children will fulfill it for them. This puts all the expectations of the parents onto the child and it doesn't give the child a chance to actually take his own purpose into his own hands. Parents who think their sole purpose is to have children often have a hard time staying together after their children leave home. In our village, polygamy is allowed. It is not viewed as adultery because it is not hidden and is only done with the approval of the wife. It's up to the woman to choose whether she wants another woman in her household. A second wife is wed into the family just as any other marriage. Many women choose this in order to bring more female energy into the house and make it lively. My aunt chose to have several other women with her. It's not seen as perverted. It's the action of a woman who feels happy in her relationship and wants to bring other women to share that happiness with her. Sometimes a man will say no to multiple wives when he knows he would be unable to sustain intimacy with more than one woman. To keep a marriage healthy, the first thing is to honor the relationship itself. Come to it as something led by spirit. The next step is to acknowledge each other's soul, acknowledge each other not just as human beings, but as spirits who have chosen a body to come into. Then, the ritual, bring these two souls together. Perhaps couples in the West could use meaningful things they have had since childhood, objects that have become sacred to them. 
with the presence of relatives or friends, bring these two sacred objects together in a pot or basket, then keep them in a space reserved as a shrine. It can be kept in the bedroom or somewhere in the house where both can have access to it. You can use that special place to draw energy from, especially when things become hard. You can go back to that source, access the time before problems came, and really draw energy from that.